Before we dive into today's insightful discussion, I want to share some updates that will enhance your FemPower Health experience. We're excited to launch our new interactive newsletter. This weekly newsletter is packed with the latest scientific findings, business insights, and essential updates in the realm of women's health. Signing up is easy. Just visit our website or click the link in the show notes. Our website is also a comprehensive resource organized by topic for your convenience. Whether you're delving into the latest research, exploring any trends in healthcare, or seeking information in specific health topics, it's all there at your fingertips. Additionally, for our Spotify users, we've created playlists categorized by these topics, offering you another way to stay informed and engaged. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, while we can't categorize content within the app, our website remains a central hub for all of these resources. And be sure to take advantage of these tools to stay on top of the evolving world of women's health, science, and business. Now let's get started with today's episode. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. In today's episode, I interview Dr. Lara Bryden. She is the author of Period Repair Manual, and I interviewed her last year to talk about that book. And this time, we're talking about her new book, Hormone Repair Manual, Every Woman's Guide to Healthy Hormones After 40. This is an episode chock full of incredible information, definitely some wow factors. And we did a lot of preparation and discussion because there's so much information to cover here. We wanted to give you the highlights so that you can start to get a sense of the types of things you can expect in perimenopause and menopause and how you can support yourself through those hormone transitions and why you shouldn't actually be afraid of this transition. And I definitely recommend that you check out her book because it's chock full of information that you need to be aware of that you can customize your plan for that uh, smooth hormone transition as you go through these stages in life. I would greatly appreciate it if you do like this episode to please rate it and write a review because that's how the algorithms work to ensure that other women have access to this incredible information. Additionally, I do put the products that are discussed in my podcast, in my store, which you can find a link on Instagram and also always in my show notes. And because I can't cover everything in my podcast episodes, I do uh, post a lot on social media, other tips and tricks for women to be aware of and be proactive and empowered around their health. So do follow me on social media at FemPower Health. So without further ado, let's hear from Dr. Lara Bryden. So why don't we start with the four stages of perimenopause, menopause, because I think that really lays the foundation of why these nuances are so important. So educate us. Absolutely. So perimenopause, just for, you know, to start with basics, is the anywhere between two to 10 years before the final period. So it starts in our late 30s or 40s. I did a little uh, social media post recently about, were you born in the 80s or the, you know, the early 80s? This book is for you. (laughs) So anyone listening who's kind of tuning it out thinking, oh no, that's for someone older. It's like, um, it might be for you. Yep. So that's a very important, because that's a very important part of the message, because if there are going to be symptoms and not all women have symptoms, but 
women who do, the symptoms are usually at their worst during perimenopause and start, and you know, the first, including the first year after the final period, which is still perimenopause. And then uh, most symptoms tend to subside later into our fifties. And certainly by our sixties, we're in terms of most things should be feeling quite good. Although as we can discuss, there are a couple of outlying issues that can continue mainly vaginal dryness, which we can talk about, but the four phases The descriptions I used were provided by Professor Geraldine Pryor, who's a Canadian endocrinologist who I have worked with quite closely. I published a peer-reviewed paper with um, last year. She is very, you know, passionate about ovulation and progesterone, and she's a real game changer in terms of women's health. So she fact-checked the book. She, you'll see there's quotes throughout the book from her. So, and and she, the phases are actually based on broader research, but the way she describes them is, you know, very early perimenopause phase one is when periods are still regular, but we start to develop symptoms, mainly from losing progesterone. So I provide her nine list of symptoms. If you have three of those and you're in your late thirties, forties, this is possibly you. So they include things like periods getting heavier, increased frequency of migraines, um, you know, weight gain, insomnia is a list of them. And although cycles are regular in that very early perimenopause, in general, the cycle shortens. So by cycle shortens, I mean counting from day one to day one of the cycle. If it used to be, say, 30 days, it might shorten down to 26 days. That's really common. It's basically just because of higher amounts of FSH from the pituitary talking to the ovaries very emphatically <laughs> to, to, you know, to keep ovulating. And that makes ovulation happen more, more quickly. And sometimes ovulation starts to not happen, which is a feature of perimenopause. And when ovulation doesn't happen, we don't make progesterone. So that's phase one. Phase two is when you start to get some irregularities. So the cycle counting from day one to day one could start to vary by up to, you know, up to seven days. Um, That's a little bit of, you know, wobbling with the cycle. That's normal. That can last two or three years. In the book, I provide a little graphic with the, you know, expected timeframe for each of those phases. Phase three is once you've had a very different cycle, like a 60 day cycle, you know, counting from day one to day one. So things starting to look quite different. Keeping in mind in the background, you always have to rule out is it just perimenopause or is it something else? Because I provide a patient story where it was actually PCOS that was kind of length, you know, affecting her cycles at that time. So there could still be other factors, even in our 40s. And then phase four is the phase I'm in now, which is what you've had, what you think is your final period. And you're in the waiting room to see if you can reach 12 months without a period, which will then mean you graduate to menopause. You've achieved menopause. That's the kind of language that Professor Pryor uses, which I love. So I'm waiting to achieve menopause. I have not yet. (laughs) You know, it's not unusual. You get, I had what I thought was my last period last January or last April. And then I went like nine months and then I got one this January. I'm like, okay. And, And you have to start counting all over again at that stage. And that's pretty typical. It's, I don't know if I've ever met any woman who had you know, what she thought was her last period. And then that's it. It it varies somewhat, but yeah. So those are the four phases. And then the next phase is menopause, which lasts the rest of our life. So menopause is a a life phase that begins one year after our final period. Okay. And what I also appreciate in the book is that, I mean, honestly, I've been dreading as well um, because I hear so many people talking about, you know, the horrible, um, I mean, side effects isn't really a word because um, I guess symptoms, because it's not a condition, it's a stage of life, but you know, yeah. all these things that aren't so fun to deal with, we can call them. Sure. And I've, I've been really afraid. And what I really enjoy is I've been hearing so many people talk about, you know, your life's not over. And, you know, first I heard your forties are the best, which I agree. And then I hear fifties mm-hmm. are even better, which I <laughs> now can't wait for because forties are pretty awesome. And so I appreciate all the hope that, that you share. And even my acupuncturist, I'm trying to record her. She does not want to be on the podcast um, and be published, <laughs> but she had a beautiful way of talking about what the Chinese um, medicine philosophies on menopause, mm. which is amazing. So if I can write it down, I will yeah. definitely verbalize it because it was absolutely gorgeous. And I'll share it with you because it really, it almost made me cry. 
was just so beautiful. Um, but nonetheless, let's get right into it. So there are solutions and there are ways to make this not so difficult. So I thought we'd take you know, step by step, just a few of the things that that I thought would be themes based on concerns I hear people having and just, you know, high level things that I noticed from your book. And then again, I think women just really need to read this book. So one is the myths and facts around hormone replacement therapy. Um, You know, again, I haven't, I didn't dive into this until your book. And I just know the themes I keep hearing are, you know, it's dangerous to be on it. You know, there's the bioidentical hormones, then it's, are they good or bad? And the interesting part to me also was when to use estrogen versus progesterone. So can you just give us the actual facts around (laughs) how we view hormone replacement therapy and when progesterone and estrogen, you know, treatment comes into play? First of all, we don't, normally say hormone replacement therapy anymore, which I, and I explain in the book, it's menopausal <laughs> hormone therapy, MHT. And the reason they got rid of the word replacement is you're not replace. It's not like thyroid replacement or, you know, growth hormone. It's not like, a, it's not like an endocrine or a hormone pathology where you've lost a, a hormone, like low estrogen is normal for menopause. It's a normal life phase. And in the book, I do talk about that, how it's really existed for as long as we've been human. I debunk the idea that everyone used to die by 40 and that therefore menopause is just an artifact of modern life, that it's an accident of living too long. That is not the case. Yes, many of our ancestors died young because of childbirth or accidents or infections. You know, obviously that's true. But even going way back into antiquity, we know that several, a significant number of people, including women, lived into old age, like into their 70s and 80s. So menopause has been there. Some women benefit from hormone therapy, absolutely, both in terms of symptoms and in some cases in terms of, you know, risk reduction for things like osteoporosis. So that's real. But also at the same time, some women are fine and, you know, don't, need it for any of those things. So I think that's important to understand heading into it. It's an option, but it's not, it doesn't have to be for everyone. You don't have to think, oh, after I lose my estrogen, that's it. I'm broken. I, you know, it's, it's not like that at all. Our body is, it's a recalibration to lower estrogen, which if you're healthy in all the ways I talk about in the book, particularly around insulin sensitivity, the real dangers come if there's insulin resistance yes. because estrogen normally supports insulin sensitivity and shelters us from some of those long-term negative outcomes from insulin resistance or pre-diabetes. So I I do, I even state in the book, you know, I think some of the long-term health prevention outcomes that are, that is seen with estrogen therapy is actually mitigating the risks of insulin resistance, but there are other ways to not have insulin resistance, right? It's not the, taking estrogen isn't the only way. It's not as dangerous as people think like there, I I guess I can safely say that I think modern hormone therapy is generally safe, not in every situation, obviously, and, and certainly not every type. So this is what it comes down to. And I, and I put this right at the beginning of the hormone therapy chapter, we have finally reached the time. Thank goodness. (laughs) When body identical, what used to be called bioidentical, although doctors don't like the term bioidentical. So don't use that term. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, it depends on the, your country, I guess, okay. but bioidentical is associated with the old days when, you know, naturopaths and compounding pharmacists was the only way to access body identical hormone therapy. So, but most, not most, but not all modern hormone therapy products are body identical, which means they are hormones that are, I mean, they derive still from plant based precursors in a lab, but they're identical. They're made to be identical to estradiol, our main estrogen and progesterone. Now that's a huge departure from what was happening back in the eighties and nineties. Like I can't even emphasize enough those drugs, hormonal drugs they were using back then, including Primarin, the horse estrogens and the progestins, which are not progesterone. They had a breast cancer risk much, much higher than modern, like just use breast cancer as the example. So modern hormone therapy does not carry a high breast cancer risk. It really does not. If you can get the right prescription from your doctor, which is in the US, 
in terms of the progesterone part of it, the U.S. it's called Prometrium. In some countries, it's called Eutrogestin. That is body identical progesterone, and that is a huge departure from the progestins they used to use. What we we look we know now, looking back at the research, like the Women's Health Initiative and some of those studies, you know, twenty years ago, the breast cancer risk was probably mostly from the progestin they were using back then. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then the other thing that I found really interesting is how, if I remember this correctly, progesterone is more helpful in perimenopause yeah, and estrogen. And I, if, I can't remember if it was all cases or most cases, estrogen plus progesterone once you've hit menopause. Yeah. Probably once you've had your final period. So I guess we'd include that final stage four of perimenopause. Okay. Yeah. Th- this is where my book departs from, from some other stuff that's out there. And this is from professor Geraldine Pryor, who has, she's a scientist as well as a clinician. So she's done multiple studies about progesterone, the benefits of progesterone. And uh, those are referenced in the book. And again, as opposed to progestin, I, I, I can't sort of emphasize this enough. The difference between progesterone and progestin is so huge. <laughs> and, so, and let's, let's clarify something. Yeah. Progestin is in a lot of birth control. Correct. Yes. So, and I so, want to bring this up only because like I told you, I spoke to many friends and birth control comes up as a topic. And it was really eye-opening to see how birth control impacts your view of what's happening with your body relative to what's actually going on. Yeah. And so I did want to just at least make that high level statement and just again, remind people like birth control does have progestin in it. (laughs) Absolutely. There's no progesterone in any type of hormonal birth control. Okay. As much as ever, you know, our forties are a time to have natural cycles and not pill bleeds, you know, not drug induced bleeds. So, but carrying on with progesterone, progesterone is the hormone we lose first. So during second puberty, progesterone, we start to make less progesterone. We make more, more estrogen, which is important. So I show a little graph where estrogen goes up sometimes by three times actually, and then progesterone drops away. So this is the kind of classic estrogen dominance that a lot of people talk about. I don't actually use that term, but it's sort of the idea. So taking progesterone during, especially the earlier years of perimenopause can bring great relief to mood, insomnia, heavy periods, migraines, and the book provides protocols for all of those. Now, there has been this conventional narrative that progesterone is bad for mood. That is not the case. Progestins are bad for mood. Progesterone is normally good for mood, although some women, it's about one in 10, it's the minority, but there is there are some women out there who, and I just have to acknowledge them, and I have a section in the book about it, who, who maybe have tried natural progesterone or Prometrium and did not feel good mood-wise on that. So- there's a few things going on with that. And I'll just, I'm just referring to it by brand name. For most doctors, if you, you go in there asking for natural progesterone or bioidentical progesterone, you'll get shut down. If you go in there asking for Prometrium and say, this is a protocol from this Canadian endocrinologist who has you know, studied that Prometrium can be helpful for heavy periods or you know, different things, the success rate will be a lot higher. Yeah, very often taking that can relieve symptoms. Um, okay. It's very sedating. So you have to, if you take it during the day, you'll feel groggy and weird. So that's quite important as well. Okay. One of my friends asked about the Mirena IUD. Will it mask symptoms? And when do I know I no longer need it because I don't want to surprise baby at 50? So short answer, hormonal IUD, Mirena or um, JDS or whatever. And they're all, they have different names depending on the dose of the progestin that's used. That's usually a drug called levonorgestrel. The pill totally masks menopause, like a combined pill, estrogen pill totally masks menopause. I have a patient story about that. You could be having pill bleeds into menopause. You're basically on a type of hormone therapy with the synthetic estrogen in the pill. So it, the pill definitely masks menopause. The pill can even mask symptoms of menopause, because like I said, it's, it's estrogen, it's a type of hormone therapy already. The hormonal IUD can mask menopause, even only in the sense that you, if it completely stops bleeding, then you won't know if your period has stopped. Now it doesn't always stop bleeding for some women. It just really dramatically lightens bleeding and you still get a real period coming through. So it really depends. Like if if it shuts down your bleeding, then you're not going to know from the period point of view, if 
you've achieved menopause or have had your last menstrual cycle, but the hormonal IUD, because it's just a progestin, no estrogen, no, no progesterone, it has no effect on symptoms. Like it can't give symptom relief for hot flashes or insomnia or migraines or anything like that. Obviously it can give symptom relief for heavy periods because that's the one thing it can definitely do. So I, what I say in the book is if you're on the hormonal IUD and you haven't been having bleeds, so you're not sure, your signal that you've reached that final phase of perimenopause might be the onset of hot, well, actually at any phase, you'll still go through all the phases of perimenopause. You can start getting increased migraines, the night sweats, all the different symptoms leading through the phases and the hormonal IUD will not do anything for those. You can actually use both the hormonal IUD and Prometrium. Ah, you can actually take know. progesterone along with that. Okay. So with the hormonal IUD, you're still cycling, but you're still, you know, going through the losing your progesterone, just like anyone else in perimenopause. So there's no reason, like there's nothing against combining them. So just for what it, you know, for what it's worth. I think I do mention that briefly in the book. I was on birth control from when I was 18 to 35. Yeah. I go off birth control and I have what I think, and maybe it is, I don't know. I have endometriosis, 26 day on the dot cycle. Yes. When I get off birth control. Yeah. I am moody, anxious, stressed out. My AMH is low. Was I in stage one then? And then I obviously, you know, had the fertility trouble and I went through in my, I think soon after my son, I went back to the 26 day cycle. And then I started having the, every other month I'd have my 26 day, then my 40 day, 26 day, 40 day, 26, 40. And now it's like, Lord only knows when it's coming. Um, But I, I, I'm like, as I'm listening to you, I'm like, hold on a minute. (laughs) Yes. Short answer is yes. You could have gone straight from the pill to phase one of perimenopause. Yep. Yeah, but you just you can still fall. You can still become pregnant, and this is the thing I want to say because no, everyone I, hears perimenopause. I, I use my own eggs, like I I did. Yeah, so you can people. A lot of my followers hear the word perimenopause and think, "Oh my god!" But I haven't had babies yet. Well, you can still become pregnant, especially in those earlier phases of perimenopause. Yep. It's more about just understanding what's happening with your body and understanding you're already in that second puberty phase because we only men's like we all, we're only in our reproductive years for, you know, 30 years or so. And right. you've got, a, you know, eight to 10 years of first puberty and the other end, you know, yeah. eight to 10 years of second puberty. So in the middle, there's really only like, you know, 20 years. And this is just the way it is. The way I've started to see it, just to share my perspective, I've started, it's kind of interesting, actually. I've started to think that the baseline of experience of being female, which includes childhood and menopause, is not being reproductive. That You know, our reproductive years are just, you know, one phase of the lifespan of being female. And it's a great, it's a fantastic phase. Obviously I'm a huge fan of our reproductive years and hormones, not just for making babies, but the whole thing. I'm a cheerleader for the whole process, but it's temporary. This is something that I wouldn't say people fear, but I'm hearing it happen. And it was so little in your book that I wanted to just double check on if you had additional thoughts, which is cysts. Um, So many of my friends are starting to talk about it. I've had two friends now that have had surgery. And these are only the friends who've told me about it. And I tell you, every time I have a little cramp, I'm like, uh oh, is it a cyst? So can you educate us around why I'm starting to see this theme? And it may just be just the end of two, and it's really not that many folks, but I just didn't know if you had words of wisdom, because I also remember in the book, you talking about so many things that we can do early on in life to make this transition in life a lot smoother. There are lots of different kinds of cysts, right? Yes. So it really sort of depends yes. on what we're talking about. Like there's endometriomas, obviously, which are endometriosis cysts, that cysts, which is a totally different thing. There's polycystic ovaries, which we won't talk about today, but are not cysts, basically. There's, uh, but then there's probably what you're describing are functional cysts, which can grow quite large, which can happen at any age, but they happen when there's been a glitch in ovulation. It's okay. like, oh, that didn't quite, okay, now we're forming this. Now that what was supposed to be just the follicle turning into a corpus luteum is now like filling with fluid. And it's common. I mean, I think part of what's going to be factoring in is being on the pill generally tends to reduce the frequency of those, of course, because you're not ovulating. Um, the hormonal IUD increases the frequency of them because it sort of impairs ovulation just enough, I think, to increase the frequency. In fact, I think it's something like of, of women on the hormonal ID, 5% develop ovarian cysts. Um, so it's just a couple of factors. 
in terms of like, in terms of the numbers of like, is it more common in perimenopause? I'm off the top of my head in terms of the stats on that. I'm not hundred percent sure. It wouldn't okay. surprise me if it is, Okay. but as a quick takeaway for what it's worth, um, for redu- risk reduction for ovarian cysts, I would say just know the risk of the hormonal IUD potentially. And then my two quick things for risk reduction for ovarian cysts is really take a look at cow's dairy and maybe avoiding that one okay. more women's health condition where I think the inflammation from dairy seems to be quite unfriendly to the situation. And the other one is iodine, which you'll notice I talk about at great length for breast, yes, you do. breast health, the ovaries love iodine as well. Clinically, I feel like iodine pr- helps to reduce the risk of ovarian cysts. All of this said, please also read the safety section in my book yes. about iodine because iodine can harm the thyroid especially if you have Hashimoto's or autoimmune thyroid disease. And there are unfortunately all different doses out there. You could get a dose. You could, if you just bought iodine online, like no joke, you could get anywhere. You could be taking anywhere from a hundred, 100 micrograms per dose to 50,000 micrograms per dose, like depending on what you end up buying. So you really do need to think about the dose and the safety. And, but all that said, I prescribe iodine all the time for okay. my perimenopausal patients. I think there's a higher requirement for iodine during perimenopause for probably a combination of reasons. So, yeah. Okay. No, that's very helpful. I have to admit when I read per- period repair manual, my takeaway was don't touch iodine. Oh, really? <laughs> I was so scared. Yes. Well, because, it, and again, this was six years ago, right? But it yeah. was, um, my takeaway was there's disagreement on the dose. And if you take too high of a dose, it's dangerous. And I was like, I don't know who to trust. And I, I don't have I mean, back then I wouldn't have had the concern. Now I'm in perimenopause, so it'd be different. But I was like, I'm scared. Who do I go to? Yeah, <laughs> to that's to I didn't want to make it that scary. I, I mean, I guess I was just trying to be careful because I didn't want no, people I know, I getting know. into trouble. But for what it's worth, actually, iodine is, has, is becoming one of my favorite treatments for endometriosis. So then um, now the, the fears, libido. Talk about libido. And one thing I did want to note. So I interviewed a woman who works at a company here in the U.S. called Parsley Health. It's like a bunch of functional medicine doctors that work through a central organization. And she is a hormone specialist there. And she had mentioned that there are patients that come to her and there isn't an equation for um, level of testosterone and libido. Now we know libido is complex because there's mental health factors that could contribute and all these underlying causes. Um, but I'd love for you to talk about libido, perimenopause slash menopause, the role of testosterone. Um, cause I know you also mentioned in the book that you're a little bit, um, nervous about testosterone. Yeah. Testosterone in excess causes weight gain in women contributes to insulin resistance. So it, by in excess, I mean when it's in excess compared to estrogen and progesterone. Okay. So there's that now. But as you saw in the book, I'm not, I understand that it, when used prop- appropriately and at the right dose, it can increase desire. You also need estrogen and progesterone in place for, well, especially estrogen for vaginal t- uh, thickness of the tissue and everything. So, yeah, libido. At, I thought about that a lot, like in re- writing the book, it's, we have this stereotype that libido always goes down with menopause. I actually don't think that's true from my reading of the literature, from my own personal experience to some extent, you know, I think so many things factor in and I'll just, you know, talk about them sort of briefly. There's certainly, there's a big section in chapter 10 of hormone repair manual about what's called the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, vaginal dryness is just part of that, but some women could have prolapse. Like if you, like, obviously if you have symptoms, if your vagina is not comfortable for all different reasons, that's going to affect desire big time because, you know, if you, if it hurts or you're embarrassed or there's, you know, so that requires treatment. Like, you know, and that's when actually vaginal estrogen comes, really comes into it, plus other things. So I think, yes, feeling comfortable down there, you know, feeling not dry, like just all of that needs to be addressed. And this is if, you know, if women want to keep having sex. And I I don't think we have to necessarily assume that every woman has to keep having sex, but I, I like, you know, most women probably do, or many women probably do not just sex or masturbation, the desire part of that. So you want to make sure you're not, you know, having dryness or symptoms. And then on top of that, you know, the desire I'd say with my own patients, actually one of the biggest factors is like fatigue and thyroid and other things affecting general energy. Cause you have to have that general 
mental energy to want to have sex. And so that's, that often needs to be addressed. I, I included a, a couple of quotes about how it makes sense to me, actually, some of the drop in desire that has been attributed to menopause generally is actually from the natural boredom that occurs after 20 years of marriage. Like that's just a thing. I don't think that's, I don't think it's bad to say that that's happening for both partners. That's, you know, that's just, that's a reality. So I think once you kind of factor that in, because you, you, you know, you talk to those occasionally, you get someone, even in menopause, if she's in a new relationship, it's like, yeah, there's no problem with desire kind of, you know, it's sort of like, you can still get that, you know, excitement. One of the questions I ask for about desire is what I ask my patients is when I'm trying to figure out what's going on. It's like, do you still, when you're watching a, like a sex scene or a romantic scene, that's well done, you know, that's, do you still get that little like pang of interest from that's kind of, to me, that's quite a good marker of what's actually happening with desire rather than, you know, how often do you feel like having sex with your partner? <laughs> it just sort of helps to differentiate. Thank that, you yeah. for, I mean, honestly, that was really well written. So thank you for sharing yeah. that. Now you talked about vaginal dryness and yeah. some of the hormones that you need for that. So tell us a little bit more that if there's anything you wanted to add outside of what you already stated. Well, this vaginal estrogen is, it's number one. Um, and just to circle back to our conversation about safety, vaginal estrogen is safe. Like every, you know, from every angle, even potentially for women who have a personal history of breast cancer. I provide a quote from ACOG um, in there about, you know, the, the safety of vaginal estrogen. So that's just something to know about, not be scared of. And that that's one of the longer term treatments too, because most, as I said, most symptoms are only during the f- um, phases of perimenopause, including just after the final period, but vaginal estrogen, or sorry, uh, vaginal dryness will just, and the bladder symptoms that go along with it and all of that will just continue to progress without some treatment. So I talk about vaginal estrogen. I talk about um, the importance of a microbiome, potentially the role of vaginal probiotics. I talk about zinc for vaginal health, which I just want to mention. Yeah. I've seeing good results with patients. Um, yeah, I think zinc can help to maintain the integrity of the epithelial cells in the vagina, which is important for then they make glycogen that feeds the good bacteria and the microbiome. So there's a close relationship between the qual- like the health of the tissue and the microbiome. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from you is once you're struggling with whatever it is that your body's doing to react to this, um, the changes in, in stage of life. What I'm hearing is take care of yourself earlier rather than later. And this is really interesting to hear because I'll, I'll just share like right now I'm starting to put the pieces together because when you live with yourself every day, you don't yeah. necessarily notice things. Yeah. And so after my transcendental meditation class, yeah, I was really calm. And then a couple of days later, I couldn't like focus and I was anxious and I thought I was going crazy. And I'm like, I, and I was really like being hard on myself because I couldn't focus. And I just, you know, paid all this money to do this class. And now I'm supposed to be the most relaxed human being and I'm losing my mind. Mm -hmm. And then I got my period and I had also interviewed um, someone about intermittent fasting And one of the things she was talking about is when you should do fasting based on the phases of your cycle. And she was even talking about, you know, the perimenopause, menopause. And I'm like, well, how are you supposed to monitor your phase if you have no idea when your period's coming? And she said, anxiety is one of them. And then I put the pieces together. I'm like, aha, Mm -hmm. that is why. And honestly, I am now motivated to go see a doctor because I'm like, I can't live like this. Maybe it's worse than I had thought. What I'm hearing you say is take care of it because you don't want it things to get worse in your life. Um, so I'm kind of motivated to just get into action because I mean, this is horrible. It's horrible. The for pre-men- me, it you're right. It's true that premenstrual mood symptoms can worsen or amplify during these years for sure. And it, it can reach the point of, as you say, like you can't go through many more cycles like that. Like it can be quite debilitating depending on the doctor, there may be limited 
options, you know, in terms of offered by the doctor, like there is the option, of course, to get to try to access Prometrium, which is the progesterone for what it's worth for progesterone. I should also mention, and I do mention in the book, it's also available like a, a, um, a first step towards getting progesterone, depending on what the condition is. And sometimes with mood, um, a progesterone cream is, can help, you know, that can be, and you don't need a prescription for that. So I'm just also putting that out there that, um, that can sometimes be a starting place. Um, certainly I've had patients and many friends who say progesterone cream, like magnesium, like what I talked about in the book, magnesium, taurine, yep. B6 plus progesterone cream. That's it. Like, it, you know, that can really help relieve premenstrual mood quite a lot. To be honest with you, part of why I haven't gone is I had to argue with my doctor to do a full thyroid panel. Like yeah. the discussion and debate about that was so annoying. I felt like I was being a jerk and I knew I was standing up for myself and I'm just so scared to go to a doctor and now get into this debate. It's pretty doable to access Prometrium for heavy periods because there's some protocols, there's Professor Pryor protocols for those, um, potentially for perimenopausal symptoms, if you kind of frame it that way for perimenopause, because she's got a published you know, paper about that that you can reference. Doctors will not generally not prescribe progesterone for PMS. Like if it's kind of put it to them that way, they're not going to, because they, they work from the perspective that progesterone is the cause of PMS, which is so crazy. Like this is one of those situations where like my view and Professor Pryor's view is actually complete opposite to the conventional. So there's a little bit of um, negotiation to be had, but actually what works for some of sometimes is to say, oh, I tried the progesterone cream and that actually really helped, but you know, I think I might need a bit more. And then like, could you consider God, prescribing Prometrium? It kind of, it can go like that in that direction. FemPower Health is pleased to partner with the upcoming FemTech and Consumer Innovation Summit. The summit is the latest deep dive event, part of the Women's Health Innovation Series, looking to tackle this growing sector of women's health, having had continental success in driving innovation, investment, research, and partnerships in traditional women's health care by bringing together critical stakeholders. Join us in New York on June 7th and 8th as we channel this success into the consumer sector of women's health. Visit www.femtechconsumerinnovation.com to view the superstar speaker lineup and enter code FEMPOWER15 for 15% off your ticket. Hope to see you there. And this is why I wanted to bring up this story and I didn't know it was going to go in this way, but I just think it's, this is why I'm just imploring people like this is what we are doing in this podcast interview is such the surface. There is so yeah. much in the book that I think people need to read because you do. I mean, I love, there were a few parts in the talk to your doctor. It was like, print this article. Here's the attachment, <laughs> I, bring it to I, your doctor. And I, exactly. I giggled, I giggled. I was yeah. like, thank you, thank you, you go. I love this. So yeah, this book will set you up for success. Okay, yeah. hot flashes. Yes. What do we do about those hot flashes? Which yeah. I'm so happy to report. I, I didn't get them much and I stopped getting them so yeah. far. <laughs> yeah. So they start usually start with night sweats. I'm just kind of circling back to the women in the earlier phases of perimenopause. The, usually the first symptom will be premenstrual night sweats. And then it can progress to sort of some daytime hot flashes as well. And then certainly they're usually at their worst just before the final period, just after the final period around those years. I've got a little flow chart. I talk about in the book, but I also have a blog post about it. So obviously there's different things that can work. But generally, just starting from the top, what I say is what I call the basic action plan for the brain. Because hot flashes, hot flashes start in the brain. It's really about this kind of energy shift in the brain, which I describe in the book. But you start with um, magnesium plus taurine, my couple supplements that I give a lot. And I just order taurine. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you don't try to identify and reverse insulin resistance because insulin resistance worsens hot flashes. Obviously, you know, reduce stress because stress is a big factor in hot flashes. And I would estimate that those, just those things, magnesium, taurine, address insulin resistance and stress and cut and quit alcohol for what it's worth or dramatically reduce, probably quit. Though that layer, that tier, if you will, of treatment, probably at least 60% of women, that's all they need. So that can 
that can, I just had a patient last week, actually, where she's, I'd laid out the whole thing, which I'm about to say to you, you know, start with tier one, then you go to progesterone, then you go to estrogen, all the different tiers. And she, yeah, she's like, I'm good. Like I'm done. I'm, I'm just going to keep using this. No more hot flushes, no more night sweats. I'll just keep doing this. And I said, if it changes, we can progress to the other treatments. She's like, that's fine. She'll come back to me if she needs it, but it can be like that. So that's tier one, magnesium, taurine, diet, quit alcohol, reduce stress movement and exercise is very helpful. Um, then tier two would be progesterone alone. Like, sorry, all those things plus progesterone, okay. but not yet, not yet estrogen. And that's according to professor Pryor's protocols. Who's found, who has found that progesterone alone can relieve symptoms of perimenopause. In fact, she argues that during perimenopause, while you're still having periods, progesterone is a better option than estrogen plus progesterone, but even into even after the final period, progesterone for some women can give relief. And then if that doesn't work, I'd always take it, always take it at bedtime. If you're going to take progesterone, especially capsules, because it's very sedating. If that doesn't work, then you look at all of those things, tier one, tier two, which is add the progesterone. Then you look at adding estrogen, which, and there's no question, estrogen can dramatically relieve hot flashes. I mean, that is a fact. And on the topic of estrogen, and I describe this in the book, if you're going to take it, I, I think that the really, the safest, the best is transdermal. So a patch or a gel that's body identical estradiol. This is the modern hormone therapy. You don't have to fight for this. This is what they give through the skin transdermal. It's just a lot safer in t- a couple of things, it, mainly in terms of the blood clotting risk. It doesn't go through the liver and form clotting factors like oral estrogen does. And arguably transdermal estrogen is also safer for breast cancer risk because it doesn't go through the liver and form another estrogen called estrone, which has a higher breast cancer risk profile. So that'd be a patch that you, you know, put on your belly twice a week kind of thing, or rub the gel in. So and then the thing to know about once, if you do start taking estrogen, that's fine. Then it's always the question of for how long do you take it? And I yes. guess that's a whole other. <laughs> In terms of symptom relief, if it's really just for hot flashes, then I think the strategy would be take it for a few years, you know, three or four years or something. And then if you want to try coming off, the, the most important thing is to taper it down because estrogen is addictive. Progesterone is not, but estrogen is addictive. So it's, if you were on estrogen and then just stop it like that, you will almost certainly get hot flashes back. It doesn't mean that, you know, you still sort of need it per se, but like it, it's, it, it needs to be tapered down over several weeks, I would say okay. in terms of maybe cutting the patch or just applying it less often. So, but also, you know, let's say the book stay on progesterone during that time, cause that can really shelter you from the tapering down process. So that's, if you want to come off, cause you want to see if maybe you don't need it anymore for symptoms. If you're on estrogen in part for protecting bone health and reducing the risk of osteoporosis or slowing down osteoporosis, the short answer is as soon as you stop it, the bone risk comes back. Like it, it, what it's kind of looking like is, you know, for something like bone health, it might need to be quite long-term. And I, I'm also at the point where even just for my own patients and I'm just, I'm also in the kind of watch this space. I want to see what the research starts to tell us. I'm not prepared to, well, I'm certainly not prepared to say every woman should be on estrogen for the rest of her life. No, 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 no. You know, lots of women don't need it for women that are at high risk of bone health for like all, you know, early menopause or history of um, anorexia or like it's different situations where your bones might be particularly at risk and then if, if those women are getting the advice, okay, you need to stay on estrogen long-term, like for decades and decades, I would be supportive of that too. So okay. I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm got it. Okay. willing to go with kind of what the research is suggesting for that individual. Yeah. Okay. Hysterectomies. I would just love your perspective on how women should view it. And, and to be honest with you, I think this is so close to my heart just because I remember being at a conference um, around endometriosis and, you know, I was hearing stories of 21 year olds getting hysterectomies. And even in your book, I think you indicate that, and I know that's not for menopause, but I think I just, I'm so like, oh my gosh, are there women getting hysterectomies that don't need to? And so I think it's just really important um, to just hear like, you know, the short version of, of hysterectomies and how 
what women should be prepared for and how best to understand if one is truly necessary. Sometimes it's necessary. I mean, I'll say, I'll say that, you know, sometimes it, obviously if severe adenomyosis or the pain or the bleeding is just out of control, then yes, sometimes it's necessary. If, and just one th- clarification, if your, ov- your uterus has been removed, but your ovaries remain, you still go through all the normal four phases of perimenopause. You're not in, you're not in menopause just because you lost your uterus. I mean, you, if the ovaries are there, you still cycle. So that's quite important because that can lead to a lot of confusion. Yes. I've, obviously, I had a lot of patients who've had hysterectomies. So I have a lot of experience with you know trying to sort that out, work that out. All that said, my key message would be keep your uterus if you can, because you know, giving a perspective, you know, I've been working for 25 years. 25 years ago, I would say the majority of women in their late 40s had their uterus out. Like it was a much more yes. common back then. And so even back then I wanted to get like a bumper sticker for my car. that said, keep your uterus, hang on to your uterus. 25 years later, it's different because now we have the hormonal IUD, there's ablation and other techniques and women are less at risk of losing their uterus. And also prometrium or utrogestin, like the you know higher dose progesterone capsules can also help to stop the crazy heavy bleeding that can lead to uterus removal. So I, in the second, in the book, I have a little section of, you know, benefits from keeping your uterus. I kind of frame it that way, like acknowledging sometimes you can't, but if you, if you can, if you can just hang on for a couple of years, knowing that at, you know, when periods, when you achieve menopause, all these symptoms, most of the symptoms will go away. Well, obviously heavy bleeding, painful symptoms should go away. Um, although fibroids, I'll just say fibroids do shrink with menopause, not completely though, not hundred percent, depending on the woman. Yeah. There's benefits just in terms of just simple things like, you know, structure of the pelvis and prolapse and things like that. Like you know, the, the uterus is part of the whole anatomy of the area. And there's even a bit of intriguing research that it's, in, it's um, connected with the nervous system, which is not no surprise because our whole body's connected. And there seems to be, some, there's an animal study where they found that animal with females who keep their uterus perform better, like in mazes and things like it seems to be related to cognition, which I find as a, cause I'm a biologist. So I find this very intriguing just to kind of think about, you know, all different things, about aspects of health that we might not be immediately obvious, basically just to debunk the idea that the uterus is only for making babies. Like obviously right. it's part of the body. It affects other things. And I would hope the majority of women can keep their uterus. Okay. No, that's helpful. If you could just say one last thing to women who are about to go through this transition are going through the transition, what message would you like to leave us with? It's so different than what you expect. I, you know, I guess anyone who's feeling fearful of the process, I just want to share that it, well, this is once you kind of get here and once you go through it, and especially if it's not as bad as you're thinking, and then you arrive as a menopausal woman and you realize that it's going to be all going to be okay. Like, you know, it's, yeah, it almost feels like it's kind of like an insider secret. Actually, that's kind of how I feel now that I'm here. It's like, oh, right. Like all the you know women 50 something, yes, they're more confident because once you get here, you stop being such a people pleaser and you've just got this kind of new perspective that is quite refreshing. I, I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, I, I talk about it in chapter two of the book. I try to put it into words, but I was scared of menopause. And now that I'm here, I'm like, oh yeah, it's, it's actually fine. Well, thank you for taking time. I don't know what spare time you have, but for putting all of these thoughts in a book, we need it. And um, I can't wait for people to be more people to be reading it. I think it's going to help so many women. And just thank you so much for all of your um, advocacy. Um, and this, um, cause I feel like that these books are being written to adv- help women advocate for themselves. So thanks for giving us the tools. Yes. Oh, and thanks for having me, Georgie. It's always nice to chat with you. Yeah, it was, and it's, this is now a, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. So I'm very yeah. happy to. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this discussion on the Fem Power Health podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to information that is referred to in this episode. 
And if you like this episode and found it timely and valuable, please take a moment to tell a friend or a colleague about Vempower Health. And right after this episode is over, please think of one person who might find this episode helpful and tell them about it. And if your friend is new to podcasting, please show them how to subscribe to our show. And another way to support Fempower Health Podcast is to leave a review where you listen to podcasts. And as a reminder, the information shared by Fempower Health is not medical advice, but for information purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the Fempower Health Podcast guests are their own and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. See you next week. Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of Fempower Health. No matter where you are in your journey, our website is brimming with content tailored to your specific topic of interest or life stage. Dive in and discover the resources and insights waiting for you. Your voice matters to us, and if you found value in this episode, please take a moment to write a review. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but it also helps others discover our podcast. By spreading the word, you're empowering women everywhere with the information they need to navigate their unique health journeys. And if this episode resonated with you, please don't keep it a secret. Share it with friends, loved ones, or anyone you believe would benefit from the information. Together, we can create a world where every woman feels supported, informed, and empowered. Remember, knowledge is power, and Fempower Health is here to guide you and support you in every step of the way. And as a reminder, the information shared by Fempower Health is not medical advice, but for informational purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the Fempower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Until next time.